Anyway, I'm Shane Lee Silver. I am a writer and a podcaster, and I am hopefully changing the narrative around single women. And also, I hope that I'm giving single women more um, support for and um, permission to live valid, happy, whole lives um, instead of living a life of shame or lack or longing um, or uh, a life in constant search. You're listening to the Codependent Millennial Podcast with Sophie Shilo, episode 50. Shaney Silver on how to live a happy, joyous life as a woman who just so happens to be single. My love, this week is so special. You are about to hear a conversation that I had with Shaney Silver, the author of an extremely important book called A Single Revolution. I'm releasing this episode on June 30th, which is also Shaney's birthday, and I think that's amazing. This book is gold. This book is years of therapy in a quick, clever, hilarious, beautiful package. This book is your wake-up call, your epiphany, your new day. This book is a manual on how to be a human. Of course, I want all women and non-binary babes listening to read this book, but if there are any men, especially fathers or future fathers listening right now, you need this too. You need to read this book. You need to get your friends to read it. You need to get your sons to read it. You need to get your dad to read it. Trust me. I really do believe that this book just cannot be overlooked. You'll see what I mean once you get into it. Enjoy this episode. You can find links in the description of this episode or visit codependentmillennial.com for the newest and best in codependency healing resources. I also highly recommend subscribing to Shaney's podcast on Patreon. It's called A Single Serving Podcast. Again, the links for that are all in the description. Shaney's website is shaneysilver.com, S-H-A-N-I-S-I-L-V-E-R.com. And her Patreon can be found at patreon.com forward slash Shaney Silver. Here's my conversation with Shaney Silver, author of A Single Revolution. Shaney, welcome. I'm so happy that you're here. Um, oh, it's my pleasure. Thank you for having me. Yeah, the, the book that we're discussing today is A Single Revolution. It's, you know, I could gush for hours about it, and I will in just a moment, but I want to start by asking you, number one, what are a few of the most important things that people know about you, you know, to introduce yourself to anyone in my community who hasn't already seen me gushing about you everywhere in emails on Instagram. I'm just obsessed. Um, So there's that. And then the next question is not only what do you want people to really know about you, but also what's the most important thing that people know about your work and this book? Sure. Um, you know, it's such a funny question because um, I, I, I'm often torn between like telling people what I want them to know about me and then also being like, I'll tell you, but will you also tell other people? Because I need more help. I can't be the only one talking about this stuff. And, and I'm not, but sometimes it feels like I'm existing in a bit of a vacuum. Anyway, I'm Shane Silver. I am a writer and a podcaster, and I am hopefully changing the narrative around single women. And also, I hope that I'm giving single women more um, support for and um, permission to live valid, happy, whole lives um, instead of living a life of shame or lack or longing um, or uh, a life in constant search for someone else. I don't think we have to live that way either. So those are the, the main things about me that I wish more people knew, um, because these things about me aren't really about me. They're about helping single women feel better. The stuff about me, I like Halloween. Like that's a big one. Um, I, you know, sparkle goth. I'm a cat person. Um, I love travel. Um, I, I collect vintage cookbooks because I find them hilarious, especially if they're like from, like a synagogue or a church and every lady's name is it. Oh, I love that. These are, these are hobbies, but um, what's most important to know about me is the stuff that I'm, I'm hoping pertains to other people and I'm hoping helps other people. Since it might be helpful for you and for others to hear an outside perspective on your work, reading it, reading your book and, and quite frankly, listening to your podcast, you know, reading your posts on Instagram, all of it, 
which everyone should become a patron of yours. Your private podcast is incredible. Thank you. There's, you just, you, you talk more authentically, more honestly, more candidly than, than a- anyone else out there. And, and that's really needed and it's valuable. So thank you. Um, but so my perspective on your work was really, it just felt like a manual for being a person, um, a manual for being a woman. And it is disturbing to know that, you know, people will be deterred from reading your work because of their fear of singlehood, which is just so, you know, there's so much there. Um, but, you know, I'm, I'm pushing this book on every girl I know, and I'm, you know, on every married woman I know. Um, and um, I think everyone, men, I mean, men read this book for God's sake, you know, like imagine if this were like curriculum. Oh, I did. I did imagine it the whole time. And people have asked me, Shani, would you ever write a book for single men? And I'm like, darlings, I have. Because if every single man would read what I wrote for single women, I think, I think the pendulum might swing back in the other direction, potentially. And reading the book, you know, every single sentence was necessary and also profound and truly I'm thank not you. just, you. you know, trying to butter you up this, it was just perfect. How every single sentence I thought, you know what, she's accounting for every moment of doubt in a single woman's mind when she thinks, no, but this might really be about my faults or this might really be because of, you know, a, an inherent flaw and and it's it is terrifying to think of women living their lives. I mean, that's why uh, there's this quote once that I read somewhere. I don't know. Um, the best gift a mother can give her child is a fully lived life, and it's true. And while your book isn't about how to be a good mom and pass along, you know, like good karma energetically, whatever, it's again, it's a manual for life. It's how to move through the world peacefully. And so again, each sentence is not only necessary, but profound. But I also find myself thinking, why does any of this have to be said? And I'm getting emotional right now, which is hilarious, but it is infuriating that any of this has to be said out loud. Correct. It's, it's wrong. Mm-hmm. Believe me, I would love, I would love for um, my niece who's, you know, 19 months to have zero need for this book, to have no need for this book at all. And hopefully, you know, in 20 years time, we won't have a need for this book. We'll have need for others, but I would love it if, and I say that just the thought that just popped into my head is like, I bet there were women who were like, Hey, we deserve birth control. Who were like, can't believe we're still talking about this shit either. So maybe we will still have a yeah. terrible singlehood culture in 20 years, but I hope not. I hope I'm contributing to a better one. It's frustrating because it is so unfair and there is seemingly so little that we can do about it. And I hope that this book shows you and anyone else who reads it that you can do so much about it. It just doesn't always feel that way because it's stuff you have to do inside of yourself and it's stuff that you have to do inside of your head and you have to become a mirror to the outside world for what a single woman deserves, what a single woman will stand for and what she won't stand for. We are, we are doing so much more than we realize by becoming mirrors of what we deserve to the outside world because, and if it helps you because we love helping other people more than we love helping ourselves because hi, we're women. Um, every time you do this, every time you, Um, say no to being sat at the kids table just because you're single. Every time you say no to sleeping on the couch at the group Airbnb, just because you're single, you're not just helping helping yourself. You're helping the next single woman they come into contact with. You're helping them respect her more too. So do it for your friends, not just for yourself and know that hopefully we're what? Yeah. Also them, if you want to have one of those, I don't. Yeah. Um, But for those who do want daughters or sons or children of every gender, we're doing this for future iterations of how the world sees single people. It's just singlehood. Fuck me. Oh, can I swear? Sorry. Of course you can. Okay. It's it's, It's just singlehood. That's it. It's not a big deal, you guys. It really isn't. And it's not even singlehood. Okay. Another horrifying part of reading the book was just, again, like, 
just feeling every single word hit me in my soul, but also feeling like it's in, it's an injustice that these words have to exist on a fucking page. I hate this. Mm-hmm. Um, but also thinking, okay, number one, when you said it's, it's unfortunate that we can control so little of this, it's funny that you said that because the exact thought that I had right before you said that was the opposite. It was, thank God the only person who has any power over us in this moment is us. And and by in this moment, I mean throughout our entire lives. Okay, so it's not singlehood, it's personhood. Again, why the classification of, it's so disturbing. The fact that being non-partnered is the exception assumed, it's horrifying. And to think about how that colors the way that we then look at children Mm -hmm. it's just and of course we see the commodification and the the adultification of children the sexualization it's like and it starts forever and it's because of the shit in your fucking book Mm -hmm. don't i mean the next time you see a little girl in preschool and she's talking to a little boy please don't ask her if that's her boyfriend please don't start instilling that in her head that young um, because it's super gross. I know it might seem cute to you, the adult, but you have a fully formed subconscious and hers why is still growing. Saying this, why, why as an adult with self-awareness and access to the internet, do you still have to be told this? Because we were raised that way and because no. our parents were raised that way and our grandparents, this is generational. Yeah. There is a huge amount of self-forgiveness that is required because you were literally raised to think these things and there was well, never any also, reason to snap out of it. Yeah, God. I guess giving yourself permission to see value in yourself as an intact whole person, like that was another thing that was reiterated in your book, wholeness and not wrongness and in your podcast too, you guys, again, you have to listen to the most recent private podcast episode. You touch on wrongness in a very meaningful way in that one too. And that the exception to the rule is, is valuing yourself. The, oh, that's, that's the generational thing. So while we are trying to like sledgehammer this horrible, disgusting bathtub to shreds, like we're also being kind of cornered into participating in it. Um, which is so hard, you know, to, to simultaneously be trying to dismantle the patriarchy while being under its heel sometimes in so many ways that, that feel out of our control. It is, it's this hilarious, tragic, you know, one of the many facets of being a a woman, someone who's socialized as a woman, trying to exist, trying to just get permission to exist. Like, just try to take it in small bites because if you try to if you try to take the whole thing at once it's like drinking from a fire hose and it will overwhelm you and it will paralyze you because it, it feels like there's nothing you can do so why bother but with anything it's like just take it take it a step at a time a piece at a time and as it comes like you don't have to we don't have to change the world today i mean good luck to you if you want to try if you have that kind of bandwidth go for it but um if you don't that's okay and you haven't failed um, this, the book is more about, um, it's designed to be reread. It is designed yeah. to be with you when you need support in the moment. Well, the okay. chapters are very clear and split so that you can, um, and I'm not going to write future books that way because this is, this, this is the, um, like the freshman year text. This is the, the book from college that you keep and you refer to over and over and over again, because it is designed to support you whenever you need it and to be with you in the room when I cannot be. Um, it is, it is very clearly laid out based on whatever like mood or sentiment or struggle the single woman is having in the moment. Um, it's, it's designed to be there with you. You, it doesn't all have to sink in and change your mind immediately. You can reread it if you need to. Oh, well, I hope so. I really hope so because I'm out of time. I got to tell you, I'm so fucking done with the way we continue to treat single women. I am so done with the deeply embarrassing pile of women fighting over a throne bouquet. I am so done with the pageantry of single people on display as entertainment for those who are in couples, as if our lives are toys to play with, as if our dating apps are toys to play with. Um, for are also, you delete your dating apps. Yeah. 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 Your um, privacy, your privacy is deemed to have less 
um, your privacy is deserving of less respect because it belongs to a single person. But yet we, we can't ever intrude into what happens behind closed doors as if single people's doors don't close. I have to pause you for a moment, even though I never want you to stop talking, because while it is true that the book is meant to be reread and you will want to reread it because it is so delightfully written, you won't want to stop. It's like the best brunch date you've ever had. Um, you also won't need to ever read it again, although you will because you'll want to, because it's such truth that when you listen to it, it just, it's you coming home. It's you realizing a truth that you were tried, you know, that people tried to convince you wasn't true, but they were wrong. Mm -hmm. So again, again, so, I mean, you talked about so many things in the book where I was literally just like screaming on my couch, like, yes, the, I mean, everything you wrote about the coaching industry mm -hmm. and therapy in general and, and how women will get not only thousands of dollars of quote unquote investment in yourself. We can talk about that phrase for an hour, mm -hmm. but you know, not only they could get all their money back, but all this energy and all this time and all this, this, you know, emotional investment, if they just did one thing, which is treat themselves as valuable. And that's everything that your book is. It's just, the solution. I hope so. I hope so. Cause it's cheaper than dating coaches. It's a hell of a lot cheaper than dating coaches who can never tell you when and where to physically be standing in order to find your partner. They can't tell you that. I'll tell you this though. I, th I think a lot of dating coaches and a lot of relationship coaches do have some very, very valuable wisdom to contribute toward existing relationships. I think there are lots of discussions to be had about healthy ways to interact inside of relationships where I get angry at this industry is that it purports to tell you where to find your partner yes. and it can't because it's not psychic and yeah. there is no game. There is no rule to it. There is no tip or no, trick no secret, that can no. guide you to your future partner. It's just horseshit. And I'm tired of people charging money for horseshit. I think, I think anyone who wants to literally invest in themselves in a coaching relationship has to, again, has to read your book. Like, who would have thought your book would be for someone looking for a therapist or a coach? Because if you don't find someone who acknowledges the truth of what's in your book, then you don't want to be working with them because you will be gaslit about the truth of the fact that you deserve to be whole and happy. And like, yeah, they're just going to still see you as lacking something. If you, exactly. if you don't understand that you are not lacking anything, you will believe other people when they tell you you're, you're lacking a partner and that it's a problem and that you're decreasing in value as you age. And well, you have to get rid of that deal breaker if you ever want to have a man, um, that, that sort of thing. It, it will whittle away everything that you want and everything that you deserve until it's as small as possible so that they can then fix you up with whoever they have in their uh, database. Little Rolodex. Okay, so... This brings me to my amazing. <laughs> um, I have pages on you at this point. Um, so I think we should just lay down a bunch of truths that all people need to know. Um, and this episode as your book is that your podcast is will hopefully just be another place that people can come where it is an injection of truth that will remind you who the fuck you are Oops. and Oops. will help you make decisions so one of the hilarious quotes you um let's see <laughs> talking about the dumbest decade of your life uh, <laughs> the dumbest decade of my life was not meant to determine you know, the entire rest of the trajectory of my life. And I think that's really important. So again, just, I mean, everything in your book was just reassurance. It felt like such, okay, one more pause before we go into our like rapid fire truth section. That's a weird new title for a podcast segment. Um, it is a heavy book, but it feels like a breath of the cleanest, freshest air. So I thank so. you. For that. It You're really, so welcome. I mean, I wanted people, I could imagine reading that book and feeling dread or fear, but 
hopefully everyone who reads that book is more invigorated by the rush of life coursing through your veins for the first time. That's because I never tell you, you have to stop wanting love. I never tell you, you have to stop wanting a partner. I never tell you to choose singlehood forever, ever. That never comes out of my mouth because it is simply unnecessary. You are allowed to want a partner and be happily single at the exact same time. Okay. (laughs) Choosing a bare minimum attitude for yourself doesn't actually serve you. So that's one of the first things that you approach in the book. And um, it doesn't need to be elaborated upon. Again, if you guys want to hear truly every single word that needs to be said on this topic, and then the book can be closed, then go read the book. Um, there were moments in the notes where I was just like, I was listening to a section of, you know, the, the audio book to try and take notes while I was writing, but then I ended up transcribing paragraphs at a time. And I was like, fuck, this note is just the whole ass chapter. Yeah. I was like, this is so annoying. I could have just... <laughs> I mean, try editing the book yourself 16 <laughs> times in a row. It was it was the hardest thing. I've taken two bar exams and writing this book was harder. It's very difficult to do, but it's so necessary and worth it. And there was no way it wasn't going to happen because it, it was very important to me to say everything that I said. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So let's, I want to mention one other quote. Um, your chapter, The Prologue Life, was mm-hmm. chapter five or six, I think. Um, read chapter five and six, both they are amazing. Um, but it made me think of this one girl I encountered in a bar in college, and she, you know, a guy, like, texted her something rude or, or just, you know, impolite, and she called him on it right there in front of people at the bar. And my thought was, damn, that was fucking ruthless. Mm -hmm. And immediately I was struck with so much, like I was so so disturbed by the fact that I really did believe and feel in my body that it was ruthless for her to simply hold a man accountable to something that he literally said or did. Mm -hmm. And when you talk about living a, like when, when you see a woman who is refusing to live a prologue life up until she meets her partner and becomes a whole being, that was another moment where I was like, damn, when I see a woman holding a man accountable for something he literally did, I feel inspired as hell. When I see a woman refusing to live a prologue life, I feel inspired as hell. Again, firing your fucking veins. It's like the best rush. So do you want to speak a little bit about the prologue life and how that is? Ugh. Yeah, a prologue life is a really, it's a very simple concept. It's the idea that your life is not real yet until you find a partner. Your adulthood is not real yet until you find a partner. You are still a child until you find a partner. Um, and you have help in that idea because the world certainly treats you like a child in, in countless ways um, until you until you find a partner. I mean, like... It's a grown woman uh, sleeping on the couch in her parents' hotel room on vacation, as opposed to just like getting her own room as a fully valid adult, because a whole hotel room is too much for a single person. It's the notion that that everything is too much for a single woman because she's not enough yet. She's, you know, what the the most ironic thing about being treated like you're not enough as a single woman. How often have you been told in the dating space that you're too much? Like I can't. When do we stop with the fucking hypocrisy and and annoying? Uh, catchphrases. It makes me crazy. Um, A prologue life is holding yourself back from the real part of your life because you don't think you're enough yet to live fully. I use my favorite example in the book of a prologue life is my couch. I used to buy really shitty couches um, because I always thought, well, I'm going to meet a guy and we're going to move in together. And that's when we'll get a nice couch. These are the thoughts that were legitimately in my head. Um, We'll get a nice couch together. So I don't have to worry about getting a nice couch now. So for a decade, I was living with like a piece of shit Amazon couch that was deeply uncomfortable, um, like wasn't big enough to have guests sleep on. So I could never have anybody over. Um, And it was just so once, once I started reframing singlehood for myself, it became instantaneously embarrassing that I hadn't tried to get myself a better couch, but then I let go of that shame because honestly, society's giving me enough. I don't need to give myself more. Um, and the day that I wrote the story about 
the couch was the day that I was going to a showroom to look at my my current couch, my nice one. Um, and there were so many moments while writing the book that were like little indicators that I was doing the right thing, just like moments like that. Um, and it was using the same mixing bowls that I had had since college. Like, why wasn't I upgrading to something that felt, first of all, not gross. They were so old by them. Um, but just like the little pieces around my home and around my world and the way that I operated that were reiterating to my brain over and over again that I wasn't real yet. I wasn't enough yet. I wasn't there yet because I didn't have a partner. I was holding myself back from living a life until I found a partner. And that's, it's so uh, counterproductive because if you haven't really lived before you find a partner, you don't know how you really live. And then you have to then figure out yourself while you're bound to another person. And inevitably that's going to be more of a challenge in my opinion, or never really reveal to yourself who you are because you were always living in tandem with someone else. So I'm, you know what, I'm tired of, of singlehood not being seen as the gift that it is. Exactly. It is an absolute gift. And you're just taught to what rush through this gift as fast as possible and find someone that's horrible. The worst, I think I said this in the book, the worst day to figure out what a gift singlehood is, is the day you get married. Yeah. Like figure it out before you have the time before this is a gift now. And I'm sorry that the gift is taking longer to get through than we might like. I'm going to be 40 next month and I've never been married. Don't talk to me about things moving slowly. Okay. I get it. I fucking get it. But I'm still grateful for every moment of my singlehood, every year of it, because it served purpose and it had and has value. And if I'm single for 10 more years, that's still going to have value the gift you gave us in the book was the permission, but also the, the explicit instruction on how to feel as if your life right now is a gift and is a blessing and is a treasure and is this precious, glorious thing. Um, this also, again, applies to and, and it should apply to anyone in any relationship ever. There is nothing in this book that you should read that would conflict with the way you behave and show up in your relationship with another person. Absolutely. If it does, that's disturbing. That is an indication that something is wrong. Um, and, and yeah, I mean, reading this book as a gauge for how well you are living, how well you are treating yourself in your one, one life. Um, it's an important reality check. Um, I hope it, it, it helps people get better at showing assholes the door. I really do. I hope it reminds people of all relationship statuses that if you are in a relationship that is not adding to your life in a positive way, if it is draining from you, if it is um, burdening you, you don't have to be in it just because it's there. That doesn't sentence you to a lifetime of singlehood. It just gives you the opportunity to reclaim a life that is happier and more free and more joyful. You don't have to be in a relationship that is wrong for you because singlehood is not worse than that. So I want to read this one question that one of my clients submitted when I told her that I was going to be talking to you. She said, I'm wondering about finding joy in being single while in a relationship, if that makes sense. Uh, how to fall in love with yourself while in a committed relationship. She's married. I got married pretty young, so I didn't have a big single phase and I feel like I missed out sometimes. So again, the book is everything you need about this. But I think the only thing that really needs to be said here is it's so possible. It's so fun. And it should only enhance your connection with your partner. Like what? Yeah. Tell me. I would just, I would tell her. Relationship. Well, yeah. And, and let's assume that she does have a wonderful marriage and I hope that she's very yes. happy. But if she wants to maintain a, an individual identity at the same time, that, that's absolutely available to her. Just do stuff alone, babe. Just start doing some stuff alone. See how that feels. See how it doesn't detract from your marriage in any way. See how it only brings you um, something of your own. And, and I hope your partner does the exact same thing, by the way. Like, I think um, having individual likes and desires and experiences only contributes to a healthier partnership because like the idea of only doing things in tandem forever seems burdensome to me. Um, it doesn't seem as interesting as doing both things in tandem and things individually. Um, Go to a movie alone, man. Like, see how it feels. And then, like, report back. 
you then get to talk about that with your partner and maybe you don't want to do it again. Maybe you want to do it all the time. Um, maybe learning how to do things separately can strengthen the partnership. We have a false idea that doing things separately weakens a relationship, but I don't think it has to be that way. Um, I think an individual's identity makes them show up more fully and authentically and hopefully as, as more of a um, like understanding and well-rounded partner, I would hope. Yeah. Yeah. So allowing is also something that you touch on in the book, looking very honestly, very uncomfortably at the behavior that we allow either in dating or in relationships or in friendships, anything. Again, this doesn't have to be about relationships like ever. Um, and that was one of the really triggering parts in the book that again was so needed. Your book is very triggering mm -hmm. and it should be if you're reading it in an honest way. Um, challenging yourself to let's see, you wrote, um, raise the value of what feels right to you so that you hold less space for everything else that feels wrong. Mm -hmm. And you are the only person in charge of what you allow. That again is a reminder that you repeat in the book enough times for us to hear it from enough angles for it to sink in, even though we've been conditioned to believe that that's crazy. And yeah, and it will take time. And and more than just time and more than changing your mind, nothing will solidify it like practice. Once yes. you put it into practice and you see that the world does not end, you will have an easier time doing it. You will have an easier time saying no to things you want to say no to and yes to things you want to say yes to. You will feel more comfortable prioritizing your own well-being once you practice doing it. We've been taught to minimize ourselves in favor of the feelings of others. But um you don't have to do that because your feelings matter just as much as everyone else's. I'm not saying go out and start being an asshole. I'm saying when someone is an asshole to you, you don't How have, to, annoying that you have to make that qualification. How I'm annoying kidding. that you have to be like, I'm not saying just go be mean to people. That's not what we're fucking saying. Yeah. But you know, we're human beings. We're deeply flawed creatures. It's okay. It's okay. If things, uh, take help and education and experience and guidance and time and patience and understanding and empathy. These things are okay. And I'm not, so you know. sorry that somewhere along the way you learned that prioritizing yourself was something that <laughs> made you an asshole. Like everywhere along the way, you learned yes. it everywhere along the way. You learned yeah. it from the day you started learning that, you know, like don't, don't make noise when you want to make noise. Be quiet when you want to make noise. Um, don't say anything back when someone says something offensive because you don't want to cause a scene. They started the fucking scene. Say something back. Like it doesn't, we don't have to be nice, polite, quiet little girls who just let like anyone say or do anything. We're allowed to speak up and use our voices. And I know how terrifying that is. And sometimes it is literally terrifying and physically yeah. terrifying. So anytime that you need to prioritize your physical safety or your emotional safety over saying something, please do and get out of whatever situation that, that you're in as safely as possible. But where you have the safety and the bandwidth to not take, um, not take bullshit from fuckers. <laughs> like, I think about all the times I went out to dinner by myself and I sat at the bar and some dude, 30, 40 years, my senior just looked at me as nothing more than his plaything for the evening. And I just would do that thing where I wouldn't answer his questions or I would just give him one word answers and not look at him and not pay attention to him. And it would only make him keep hitting on me more. This used to happen every time. It doesn't happen anymore. Um, and I always would think in my head, that I can't say anything. I can't get angry. Mm. I can't stab him in the hand with my knife. Um, because I can't cause a scene, right? I can't, I, I can't disrupt everyone's evening. There's yeah. other people in the restaurant. I can't disrupt everyone's evening. Or his evening. Right. Yeah. So I would just um, find myself in some really difficult and uncomfortable situations. Now I'm comfortable saying, I do not know you. I do not want to talk to you. Please stop talking to me. And if that is not enough, get help. There, there are staff working there. Not that we need to like ask people working at restaurants to help us out anymore. I mean, like anywhere. I'm not, I'm just using the restaurant as an example. Um, or, or my favorite one is leave. My favorite one is leave. And I'm sorry that sometimes our evenings get ruined and our plans get ruined and we have to remove ourselves from situations, but I would rather do that than just sit there and think that that's what we have to sit through. 
yes. uncomfortable situations are not something that you have to sit through um, where you can that, leave. That bar metaphor truly is, should be applied to everyone's relationship when they ever get into one. There is a disturbing amount of like times that I just get asked about, well, what if he just wants to blah, blah, blah. And what if I like just all of this questioning, all of this refusing to give yourself permission to just want what it is that you want and say no to what isn't that. And, and so much hesitation about, is that even okay? And again, we know where it comes from. We know why we have that, but it's horrifying and it should disturb us. Well, life is easier for other people when single women settle. Yeah. When we, when we look at what we want and we start taking those things away because, oh, you're, you're never going to find someone if you want that. No, no one is like that. You can't want that thing. There's no one out there who is like what you want and deserve. That person doesn't exist. You need to lower yourself or you're going to be alone forever. Um, completely ignoring that being alone forever is better than being with the wrong person forever. Yes. So, yeah, it gets exhausting. Anyway, I say it much more clearly and eloquently in the book, but you don't have to, you don't have to erase what you want and settle to make the world happy if it's going to result in your misery. Like, how, how does that make sense? And I wrote that chapter about, um, like, not dating from rock bottom while I like having very strong memories of the very end of my experience on dating apps when I was in my mid thirties and I was barely ever matching with anyone going on. I mean, maybe two to three dates a year. It was just not happening. And I kept thinking that I had to keep removing and removing and removing things that I wanted if I ever wanted to meet anyone at all. And then I was confused about why, when I would go out on those dates, they would be horrific because I was settling for someone I knew I had no business meeting. I was just dating from rock bottom and dating was meeting me at rock bottom. And no one wants to hear me when I say delete your dating apps. When I say remove yourself from a dating space, that's making you miserable because then they think, well, how will I meet someone? Are you meeting someone now? Is it working now? Why are you so afraid to leave a punishing space and experience all of life on the other side of it? And Hey, I think there are more opportunities to meet people in all of life than just in dating culture. And I know too many couples who met without dating at all to think that that's bullshit. And the amount of pain that you're willing to put yourself through in the simple name of, again, fixing your singlehood mm -hmm. is so not okay. So more quotes from Shaney. Wanting less is not the ticket to a relationship and a relationship isn't the ticket to happiness. Again, with this fallacy that when you find a partner, then you become this weird fantasized version of yourself. It's so, again, stop fetishizing it. Stop, stop it. It's, uh, it is, it is poison. You know, it's not true. Grow up. Like that's in the most loving way possible. Just grow up. That's not at all what we're doing. We're adults. Okay. So you said also another quote that I wrote down, it's the love I have for myself that has erased all compulsion to make my singleness something so wrong with me that I'm willing to lower my natural human desires down to nothing on the assumption that wanting nothing will somehow lead to love. Right. This yeah. has been a great podcast. Thank you for coming. <laughs> That's the only thing that needs to be said. Mm -hmm. So also, if you're listening right now and you've had a moment on, on this podcast during this conversation where your heart has just sank or you just felt like you knew something, even if you're not ready to say it out loud to yourself, just, just let's between you and me right now, like, you know, something, something important, you know it. Another another practical skill that your book gives us is very concrete steps towards just trusting yourself and dealing with the consequences of being true to yourself mm -hmm. as trite as it sounds. 
Not everyone's ready to hear this shit, by the way. Not oh everyone God. is ready to read the book. Not everyone is ready to hear this. And you don't have to. It is not required. Reading my book is not required of you. Um, finishing my book is not required of you. Not everyone is ready to hear this. I wasn't ready to hear it for a decade. So I fully understand that mindset that is not about to start listening to someone saying, delete your dating apps. Believe me, I lived as that woman for 10 full dating, clawing, scraping, settling for crumbs years. And you couldn't have said anything to get me out of it. The only thing that got me out of it was my brain coming around to these thoughts on its own. And thank goodness it did. But um, it took a long time. So if you're not ready to hear this, you don't have to be. You can do whatever you want with your life whatever you want. But if you are done feeling like shit about being single, if you are done living your life in pursuit of someone else's life, um, read the book. You might feel better. You will. That uh, I, I appreciate it again that you talked about how to handle the fact that it's easy to get trapped in this like space where you look back at time that has elapsed and you assign meaning to it mm -hmm. when it's literally just time that has elapsed. Um, and again, the thoroughness of your book is, is such a gift because something that trips people up, you know, you could say all the self-worth stuff, someone could be totally on board for that, but then they run into this wall of, bitterness or resentment or panic and fear that they think is valid because a certain amount of time again has gone by like you just or they just want to find someone yeah self-worth is great self-love is great awesome yeah where the fuck's my husband like honestly exactly. like this is this is often the mindset this is yeah. often the mindset it's it's centering this one thing you don't have and dulling the shine on everything that you do mm -hmm. yeah yeah that that was the scariest thing like just knowing how i've done this and how thinking about other women doing this too not enjoying your successes your the 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 moments of your life that are really that you're going to remember forever that you want to remember on your deathbed all because you were allured there was a lure of some promise of what partnership would bring to your life it's this wouldn't mean anything without someone to share it with oh you nonsense. poor thing. You it's poor nonsense. thing. Yeah. Absolute nonsense. Every time I've heard oh. that said from like the Oscars stage, I'm like, Oh God, really? Really? It wouldn't mean anything without someone to share it with who didn't do the thing you're being celebrated for. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And if that is how you feel about your own successes, really look at your relationship with yourself because you might not have a really healthy relationship with the people in your life or, or work or like you, you should love you and your life. It's just like, we're talking in circles at this point. It's basic. It's, it's really basic stuff. But for many of us, we've never been asked to think of any of this as, um, None of this has ever had to be on the page before. We've just kind of been autopiloting through adulthood, just assuming that if you're single, you date. It's a very casual relationship. If you're single, you have to be dating. You have to be searching until you find someone and then you can stop searching. We've never been told that you can stop searching before because if you stop searching before you find someone, oh, you've given up. Oh, you've chosen spinsterhood. You sad, pathetic, old woman. You know what I mean? Like it's it, choosing your own well-being over the modern dating space is always seen as a failure when in my opinion, it is just the opposite. It is the opposite. Okay, two more quotes I wanna read from you. The assumption is that I have to alter myself in order to meet him at the lower level at which he is interested in participating. I misquoted that, but again, like- It's about breadcrumbing. Yeah, the assumption is that you will, and, and breadcrumbing, like I didn't even like know what that term was. I had to like look that up, but it obviously makes tons of sense. Like women, single or otherwise, if you are completely ignoring or not even being aware of the things that you want and need because you're waiting for his list first so that you can just make do with whatever that is, what are you fucking doing? Like, again, we get it. You've been conditioned like this your whole life, but 
don't choose to spend another day in that. And again, you're right. A lot of people aren't ready to hear that. And, and, and that's a, like, it takes as long as it takes you, you, you can't rush yourself to that moment that, that you had where you deleted your dating apps, where you like believed in your self-worth finally, like you can't rush that. But hopefully, hopefully if you, if you read this book with an open enough mind, you'll shorten your path to it. And that doesn't, again, it doesn't matter if it means it shortens your path to a partnership because that's not the fucking point. You're just going to love being alive. I think, I think if you're exhausted, that's enough. If you are single and you are exhausted either by your own singlehood or by dating or by the way people talk about you and treat you, whatever is exhausting you, exhaustion is enough to read this book and benefit from it. You don't have to do any other work in advance. You don't have to achieve any sort of like Instagram miracle self-love to read this book. If you're tired, if you are exhausted by all of this shit, that is enough to read this book and benefit from it. Yeah. Um, you said they're responsible for meeting your needs or getting the fuck out of the way. And again, very, very, very important. Um, as a codependency coach, I talk a lot about, you know, needs and things in relationships. And I've already spoken to that. And none of that contradicts that statement in any way yeah. at all. This is not about making other people responsible for your happiness. This is about you finally, for the love of God, not putting yourself absolutely dead last um, and putting yourself first. Yes. A hundred percent. I have a question for you. Yeah. What were some of the, you know, in your darkest moments where you were doubting yourself the most feeling the least worthy, all of it, what do you think were some triggering questions that could have like woken you the fuck up in those moments? Oh God. I don't know if anything would have worked. Right. Um, I, I really don't because it was just such a, a thorough brainwashing into, I have to find someone. I have to find someone. I have to find someone. It wasn't even active. It was passive. It was an extremely passive. I, I did dating and dating apps as any other chore for me. It was just laundry. It wasn't anything like I wasn't terrified into, you know, frantically swiping. It wasn't active. It was far more passive than that. And I found that more dangerous. I found the, yeah, I found the casual belief that I have to date until I find someone to be so much more dangerous than any sort of like conscious fear. It was yeah. just very much like, oh, I'm going to do the dishes and then I'm going to swipe because I have to, because that's one of the things that you do to, to run your household as a single person. Oh, I'm waiting in line for coffee. The first app I open is a dating app because I have to, because I haven't found someone yet. That's just what you do. It's just what you do. That's why it was so um, deeply ingrained. It was just what you do. It was just an assumed approved of way to exist no yeah. different than brushing your teeth in the morning it was yeah. that casual and that um, muscle memory that's just what it was yeah. so no nobody could have woken me up out of it it had to take 10 years and really a really difficult set of 10 years with dating I never had one relationship result from 10 years of effort and you got to ask yourself at a certain point like what the fuck man not why am I not meeting someone but why am I still doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result? That's insanity. Yeah. It was, I mean, there was, and I'm lucky, like I was able to take everything that I had gone through and turn it into a career. So I'm not mad at that at all. That had a lot of purpose for me, but your purpose is something different. Everyone's purpose is something different. Every moment of our singlehood is an education for us. It's up yeah. to us how we choose to use it. Um, you can ignore it if you want. I don't recommend that because I think it's holding you back from living a full, complete adulthood. Um, and I also think it's going to hold you back in future relationships because you're still going to fear being single and you're still going to stay when you shouldn't. You're still going to accept less from your partner because you're afraid of being single. You're going to be afraid of, of asking for what you need. You're going to be afraid of setting boundaries and sticking to boundaries because nothing is worse than being single to you. So you just let everything else fall away until you are a self-worth shell of who you could be. Um, and you don't deserve that. You're, we're alive one time that we can remember and you really want to spend it minimizing yourself. I don't. Amen. Yeah. Amen. That's, that's all I have truly. <laughs> <laughs> 
It's, it's not that I want to end the conversation. It's just that I think it's important sometimes to know when the painting's finished and you want this message to reach as many women as possible. And you do have to say things a lot of times in a lot of different ways for someone to hear it and liberate themselves finally. Yeah. They will. Don't worry. No. Yeah, totally. It's, it's just, you know, ending this, like knowing that everyone has a choice it's taking some time. I'll give you that. It's taking some time. Um, but I would rather, I would rather the process require patience than never have existed at all. So I'm okay with that. Um, but yeah, I hope it's helping at whatever pace it's going. I hope it's helping. Is there anything else that you want to add? Is there anything that, uh, anything else that you'd like to add? I mean, of course, tell people where to reach you and find you and I'm going to include all of that. So you don't even have to go into that if you want, but Just anything else that you want singles to know? You know, the first part of the book is going to tell you a pretty radical idea. And that is that being single isn't wrong. And all you've ever been taught is that single is a wrong state of existence. That being in a couple is correct and being single is wrong. And um, a big, big change that you should be really proud of yourself for once you've made it is that it isn't. There is nothing inherently wrong about being an individual adult without a romantic partner. There is absolutely nothing factually wrong with that. Um, so challenging that is, is at the very beginning because I think it's going to help the rest of the way. Um, the way that we view what we are is hugely important in feeling better about what we are. And you have a choice in how you view it. You don't have to view yourself as single and wrong and bad and sad and lonely just because the world, you know, casts the single best friend in every rom-com that way. It's your choice. It isn't true that we're that pathetic, sad friend. Um, It's just the way the world likes to talk about us because that's easier and more convenient for the world when all women want to focus on is finding their romantic partner. That are based on lack and fear. Like... Of course, but there's nothing inherently wrong with being single. And as soon as you start living that way, life opens up so much wider than left and right swiped with your thumb. That's all I got. Wow, amazing, right? She is incredible. I hope this episode was of value to you. To learn more about Shaney and her incredible work, visit shaneysilver.com or patreon.com forward slash shaneysilver. You can always text me at 216-279-4035 for free weekly texts that will help you end the confusion that comes with trying to heal your codependency. Have a gorgeous, gorgeous day, and I'll talk to you soon.